Hi, friends. Welcome to today's episode of the Professional Book Nerds podcast sponsored by Overdrive. Before we get started today, a reminder to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and to follow us on social media. We are at Pro Book Nerds on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and you can reach us via email, professionalbooknerds at overdrive.com. With that, let's get into today's episode. Today, Emma and I are chatting with Sierra Godfrey. Sierra was born in Santa Cruz, California, and has lived in many places, including Santorini, Greece, when she was a child. She's a technical writer by day and lives in the Bay Area with her family, which includes a dog, two cats, and a turtle. Today, Sierra is here to talk with us about her book, A Very Typical Family, our July 13 through 27 Big Library Read title. If you want to join Overdrive's Global Digital Book Club, you can borrow the book in Libby or Sora now with no wait lists or holds. And with that, let's get into our interview with Sierra Godfrey. Well, Sierra, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. We're so excited you're here to get us started. Could you tell us a bit about A Very Typical Family? Yeah, so it's uh, my debut novel, and it was uh, set in Santa Cruz, California. And its tagline I love is, all all families are messy, some are disasters. Uh, Natalie Walker is the reason her older brother and sister went to prison over 15 years ago. She fled California shortly after that fateful night and hasn't spoken to anyone in her family since. And now on the same day, her boyfriend steals her dream job out from under her. Natalie receives a letter from a lawyer saying that her estranged mother has died and left the family's historic Santa Cruz house to her. Sort of. The only way for Natalie and her siblings to inherit is for all three children to come back and claim it together. So she drives cross country to Santa Cruz with her willful cat penguin in tow, expecting to just sign some papers, see her siblings, maybe not at all or very briefly and get back to sorting her life out in Boston. But her brother, Jake, now an award winning ornithologist, is missing and her sister, Lynn, is working as an undertaker and she shows up with her teenage son. And when Natalie and her nephew look for Jake, meeting a very handsome marine biologist who immediately captures her heart, she unpacks the guilt she's held on to for so many years, wondering how or if she can salvage a relationship with her siblings after all this time. Such a good description. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if that doesn't hook you on the story, just from the jump. (laughs) Yeah, you you hit all the high notes there for sure. And so the reason that we're here today to talk about A Very Typical Family is because it was selected for Overdrive's Big Library Read, our global book club program. How did you feel when you heard it had been selected? Oh, I was floored. I'm so flattered. I was like, are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) It was so exciting. And then, of course, because um, I'm somebody who has to go research everything I hear about, I immediately went and I had never heard of Big Library Read before. So I was immediately online, biglibraryread.com. I looked at all the past titles and then I think it really sunk in. I was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. There's some incredibly beautiful books that have been chosen. Um, And the breadth of the program is so exciting with the discussion boards and just, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And then I have to say, what really hit me is all of the libraries from around the world started um, taking graphics, you know, that were provided of, of my book and saying, here's the next big library. And I was like, oh, my God, I know. <laughs> all these libraries. It was so cool to see that. Yeah, it's amazing to see how quickly they'll pick up that jacket cover. And you're like, oh, I, I'm seeing my book everywhere now in different everywhere. languages and <laughs> in, in all sorts of things. Um, yeah, it was a huge hit of dopamine seeing all of that all over the place. It was great. <laughs> are you excited about the discussion board? Oh, yeah, I am. Um, I'm a little afraid of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's what happened. So, um, yeah, I, I can't wait till people start reacting to it. I feel like readers, for the most part, are very respectful and very enthusiastic and like they lean into the excitement. I think it's rare we get people that are just sort of grouchy. So it should be a really fun time to look at the discussion board. 
and to hear what oh, people want to know about your process and your books. But they can also hear some yeah. of that here because, of course, I have to ask, what inspired you to start writing and when do you first remember writing? I wish that I had a year when I started writing. I think it was pretty young. Um, I, <laughs> I did write and illustrate a picture book called When Pigs Can Fly when I was quite young. <laughs> um, but clearly not a precursor to later work. Um, but so, yeah, I think I've always written, but I didn't really start writing novels until I was around 30. So that's, and I, and I, once I did, I was kind of like, I can't believe I haven't done this before. This is so strange because this just fits. This is absolutely what I want, you know, what I want to do going forward, what I wanted to have done all this time. So yeah, I've always written. Yeah. And so you're a technical writer for your day job. Um, so does yes. that contribute to your storytelling or at the way in which you sort of plot or utilize your overall writing process? Like you do it for many different it's, formats, it feels like. Yeah, I do. Um, I I currently uh, write for software documentation. So it's a very specific type of technical writing. Um, and I, I don't think it does inform storytelling at all, but I would say that I and naturally drawn to structure. And, um, you know, I certainly do that as part of the day job. And I am a fan of structure when I write uh, sometimes because <laughs> I'm also a fan of letting the story go and see where it takes me. Um, I would love to say that I start off with a, an outline and just go from there. And sometimes I do, but I also uh, veer off the path quite a bit too sometimes. I, I think we can all relate to that. You you start with <laughs> some of the best intentions and then you end up where yes. you end up. That's some of my some of my youngest road trips. <laughs> I had a goal in mind. Well, we ended up in a different state. <laughs> yeah, and then you see where it takes you and it's kind of fun. Kind of yeah, great that I, way. I had a I have a lot of great memories that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, are there any essentials to your process when you are setting up the writing? Do you need silence? Do you have music? Are there go-to snacks, which is always my favorite thing to ask? I wish I could say yes, but I live in a, a very busy, chaotic house with children and animals and barking dogs and cats wanting their dinner. And so I take it, I just snatch time whenever I can get it these days. And when I started writing, I would write late at night when my kids were very little and they were in bed. And that was like, you know, the perfect time because nobody was talking to me or needing me. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. my time. And I still prefer that. But these days I can't stay up that late. So um, yeah, I snatch it when I can, I guess. And uh, I would love to say I need silence. I think that's preferable. Gosh, I would love that. But the reality is when, <laughs> whenever is a good time that I'm not be bothered. <laughs> whenever it's the closest to silence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now to dive right into the book, Natalie goes through quite a lot during the course of the story. I think that's the simplest way I could say it. She often stands in the way of her own dreams and kind of slowly gains confidence in her wishes and in her choices. Do you think we often stand in our own way in real life? I think we do. I think we do all the time. Yeah. And I think Natalie was arrested by this trauma that happened first when her father died, when she was young and all three of the siblings kind of dealt with that in their own ways, which then informed some of the bad choices made later on, um, which is referred to in the book as that night, uh, which is when <laughs> Natalie essentially makes the call that gets them sent, her sis, siblings sent to jail uh, or prison, I should say. Um, but I think that as an adult, she was never really able to move on from that, uh, especially without her mother's support. So having these two older siblings who have always looked out for her and taken care of her, and even if they didn't know it, been a role model for her, um, not talk to her and, you know, turn their backs on her for a good reason, uh, is so painful that she may have think she's gotten over it, but never really has. I think we often get in the way of our own uh, happiness and growth. Sometimes there are a lot of things we have to work through. And Natalie certainly has her fair share of things to tackle in this story. One of the things I really liked about this book is that Santa Cruz is the setting. I have really fond memories of Santa Cruz uh, in the 90s, but I haven't been 
uh, in a very long time, but it also feels like a character almost uh, the way that you describe it. I'm wondering if it feels the same um, as it did when you lived there. I haven't been in a very long time and also how you sort of embody that embody that feeling of being sort of in Santa Cruz back in the day? Oh, those are such good questions. I, I think that, um, so yes, I, I lived there until I was around 11. Um, and I go back frequently and I take my kids now, but the feeling is definitely different. But part of it, that comes from me being a visitor this time, as opposed to somebody who lived there. So there's a totally different approach to it. Um, I think that when you live in Santa Cruz, uh, you're dealing with a, a totally different point of view. You're probably not very favorable towards the tourists, which descend and clog up the streets. Um, so yeah, the feeling is very different as a visitor, but it's also different because I want my kids to uh, feel like it's home, like it's comfort to them, but it isn't because it, that's just my feeling when I go. Um, they're just like, yeah, okay, this is where my mom grew up and it's got great beaches and let's hang out, but it's it's very different. Um, but the, to answer the second part of that question, which was, <laughs> oh God. No, you're okay. I was a rambling question. It was twofold as well. So also just how you sort of yeah. tackled writing this Santa Cruz as the setting and also kind of a character. Yeah, the character. So uh, that was a real stab for me, right? I really hoped I was getting it right. Um, I've been there, clearly lived there, walked those streets many times, um, lit, you know, returned to it. And and as I was writing it, I did travel those same pathways um, when I would go visit just to, and I would go, go by and visit some Victorians that I know around town just to kind of get the picture and the feel. Um, but ultimately, you know, it was just a, it was just a hope that I got it right. And I think I did. I got it right for me. And that's what mattered um, because it is, it still feels like home to me. When I head down over Highway 17, when I approach San Jose, even to go uh, that way, it, it starts feeling like home. There's just a sense that it, it's there waiting. And so for me, it, you know, I, I was able to write what I felt was was good, but I have heard from so many people who live there or who used to live there, oh, you just nailed it. I'm like, oh, that's so wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. So glad it's working for everybody. Yeah, I think you absolutely nailed that depiction of Santa Cruz. It, even if it's not my home, it certainly felt homey in the story and you understand what it means to the characters and Natalie and her siblings and so on. Yeah, and the part of, uh, I think what I really put in that story is that it is a welcoming home, it, but that's how it is for me. And it definitely is that way for Natalie too. You know, she comes in and I always, you know, smell the smell you're smelling. <laughs> I, I talked a lot about the, the smell of the sea, right? You have that sea kelp smell and that kind of salty feel and that's all there. It's just, it's like, it's a total sense, sensual, the sensual is not <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's an array of senses. You've got the bright sunshine, you've got the blue of the ocean and the blue of the sky, and you've got the smells of the sea. So it's, it's like a whole thing, a whole yeah. experience. A feast for the senses. You've got a little That's bit it. of everything. <laughs> It, it really is. And it, it made me ask my mom to pull out photos of our trips to Santa Cruz. So oh, that's awesome. I love that. I love that. It's making people want like when my mom read it, she's like, I I'm going to go book a weekend there. I just want to go back and feel it too. And I'm like, Oh no, let's see. I love that. Hey, then goal checked. Like you, you embodied exactly what you wanted to. You've got the people <laughs> you've you've got the people looking into the past and and thinking of all those fond memories, which is is so powerful. Um, I think with that same kind of thing of it feeling like home, you're also familiar with so many places. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Walker Lab, Jake's Lab, which is based off of the Longs Marine Lab in Santa Cruz. Could you tell yes. us a bit about your relationship with the Marine Lab? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I I visited that place for since I was very little and it was originally in portables and really spread out um I 
got to be a docent there when I was 11, which I think I was the youngest docent ever at the time. I think there was a pretty rigorous process where, you know, uh, you had to go through training and sit through classes to be a docent. But I hung out there a lot. And I think I was asked because I was a little bit of a know-it-all in the aquarium. They had a little aquarium and a portable. And I'd be like, this fish does that. And this fish does that. And they're like, do you just want to be a docent? <laughs> they're like, you're <laughs> was- here every day anyway. Could we make yeah. use of you? Yeah. <laughs> Can we put your running mouth to use? Um, so it was, and it was really cool. It was so neat. And I would give little tours. It was like a whole thing. So, um, and then they they rebuilt this visitor center. Um, I, I'm not even sure when, I think when I was probably in my late teens or so. And uh, it's, so now they've got this huge, beautiful building, which a bigger aquarium. And it's just, it's really cool. So um, it's, it's been great to see the place evolve. Definitely holds <laughs> one of my earliest memories. I remember they had one of their great things to fame is the uh, blue whale skeleton. It's one of the most complete, um, you know, pinned skele- skeletons. And uh, it used to sit in a field you know, unloved kind of. And I remember that from a kid, it was just kind of down from the the Marine lab. So yeah, I have this, this cool, cool beginning <laughs> memory of it. And I can relate to that. The like, Oh, I love this place. I'm going to be there every day. That's how I got my first job at the library as a library page. I was <laughs> always there growing up that. and it's like, could I just shelf books here, please? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I wish I had done that with the Garfield Park branch, which was right around where of the Santa Cruz library, which was right around from where we lived. And I would this, this gorgeous, like kind of classical little building, um, just such a neat little outpost for the Santa Cruz library. And I would go there all the time and Ugh. sit and read their magazines and books. And uh, yeah, I got around in Santa Cruz. <laughs> right. No surprise. We love libraries here. So <laughs> no surprise. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Santa Cruz was my very first library card held. And I have held, I think I still have that card. I found it the other day. I took a picture of it. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I still have it. I can throw away any of my library cards. Yeah. No, you got to keep them. The best yeah. collection. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of things that we love and adore, would you say that writing settings that you were familiar with made them more special uh, in the process of writing the book? They made them more special, but they also made them harder because I wanted to get them right. And I feel like if I'm going to write about a real place, then I want to have enough detail. I want to be there. It's it's hard. You know, um, I'd like to set books in many different places, but I don't have experience with the entire world. So um, there's there's ways to do it. And I think ultimately you just do the best you can with as much research as you can somebody's always going to complain, oh, you didn't get this detail right, or, you know, whatever. Um, But I think most people will appreciate (laughs) if you can get a lot of the details in there. Um, So yeah, I I definitely wanted to write something that I knew about, but that wasn't a requirement for me. Yeah, I don't even know if I would have thought of it that way, that like the stress that it would put under, because right? Those places are so special to you. It means they mean more and it means yeah. you're more critical of yourself while you're trying to figure out what exactly they look like and how to translate that to others. Um, what made you decide on this setting for this book? Like why, why was your first book, your love letter to Santa Cruz in this way? Yeah, I, it was always going to be a love letter to Santa Cruz, I think, yeah. for my first book. It was just like a, that was just not negotiable. Yeah. Um, but it was very important that the healing for the Walker family um, took place at home because they had all spread all over the place. And it was, you know, Natalie goes to Boston which on total other opposite side of the country. So right. it's really important that she comes home and feels this sense of home, even though she's been away. And when she first arrives in Santa Cruz after being back, uh, after being away for so long, she's kind of like, you know, this is this is very temporary. I'm not here for very long. But what I wanted to do is make that pull of home even stronger. And so later in the book, she's kind of thinking, well, I don't know if I really want to leave this. This is really good. You know, this is where it all begins. This is where my my feeling of home 
feels for me. So it was, it was like easy for me to place it in Santa Cruz because I was using that feeling of home and homecoming. And because you mentioned Boston, what drew you to kind of the East Coast, going from coast to coast, so much distance apart, and uh, Boston specifically? Well, I think I was just shooting for far away. <laughs> that works. Uh, but also I lived, <laughs> yeah, I lived in uh, Massachusetts for a couple years too. So I was a little bit familiar with it. Love it. <laughs> I have a, a very articulate question, uh, Joe, that I'm going to add in. And this is, uh, we will say for our listeners, a little bit spoiler adjacent, although hopefully they've read the book or are reading along with the book. Uh, so they'll get to this point. But one of the main um, points of the book is Natalie's relationship with Paul. So he has sort of taken this job that she's after and sort of adjusted all of her future plans. And he's sort of offering her a different future. He has like a very clear picture of what he wants her to do, uh, which seems to be really at odds with what Natalie thought, uh, you know, the, the coming months would look like. And so my question when I was reading, it was like, what's the deal with Paul? Why is he so set on having this sort of picture perfect relationship that's maybe not in line with what their actual relationship is? Yeah, Paul is a character I love to hate, and I think everyone else loves to hate, too. Yeah. One of the best things I heard from people was, oh, that Paul. Oh, I hate him. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he's doesn't mean to be controlling, I think. I think he doesn't know any other way. He is a guy who's older than Natalie. He's the older brother of her best friend and a uh, much older brother, like five years, maybe more. And he's been away. He's been off in Europe having this illustrious career. And so he comes back home for whatever reason. And he's looking for, you know, he, it's his homecoming and he wants a great job, which is sort of how he takes the job she was hoping for, which by the way, she was not prepared for, not, not ready for it. And that job was just not even right for her. Um, but she didn't have the right idea about where she needed to be. So she had been hoping for it for herself. Um, so yeah, I don't think he realizes he's controlling, but that's his issue is he came back, he's got this job and now the girlfriend won't fall in line, you know, with all that. So that's kind of what I was going for with him. Yeah. <laughs> and as she leaves and goes across country, she's slipping from his grasp in this idea of what he hoped for himself, which is come home, get this nice job, then get married, start a family. And that is just not going the way he wanted it to. Yeah. And I think that his behavior, I mean, and her not getting the job sort of opens doors as you see, you know, the story progress that Natalie hadn't even considered or didn't even think were meant for her. And we, it was nice to see some of these pieces like of, of career things and relationship things without giving anything away that do seem more suited to her that I don't know that she would have gone for had things not unfolded that way. Yeah, I, you know, some of that's definitely from me. I, you know, never thought I would be a writer. I didn't consider certain things for myself. I worked as a graphic designer for a little while too, and I never had any formal training in it. And I didn't think I could do that. And I, I didn't go for certain things because I just never considered it for myself. Um, and I think Natalie's in a little bit of the same boat where she just didn't let herself explore um, maybe creativity is part of that but she just didn't let herself explore any avenues other than what she thought was this one path maybe that one path would aid towards the healing of whatever she thought was going on um, but always always relates back to um, you know the loss of her family I think that's such an important reminder for all of us that like Nothing is a yes or a no. The worst thing you can do is pose the question and see how things turn out. I mean, throwing yourself into the world of writing and look at this, you've created this beautiful work that, you know, that people can pull parts of and relate to. I, I think it's just always good to have that, that recognition. So it's a, it's a great reminder for everyone to walk away with for sure. Yeah. And just, just try because you don't know what's going to happen in, unless you try, but 
what sure won't happen if you don't try is you won't get it. So you have to put yourself out there. And that definitely is something I've learned through the whole publishing process is if you don't do it, if you don't submit that, if you don't query that, you won't get anywhere. Right. You're, you're not going to get anything that you don't ask for. So (laughs) throw it out there, see what sticks, pasta (laughs) on the wall. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And if you're not sure what's going to stick, because a lot, I think a lot of people, you know, they go into college, some people know what they want to do from an early age. Some people find out later, some people never know, or it takes much, much longer. And I don't think enough recognition is given to that uncertainty. And, you know, sometimes it just takes a while and it's okay to be a little older in your life and still figure it out, but try many things if you don't know what you want and see what you like. Exactly. That try all the shoes in the store because you're going to find a couple pairs you yeah. like in the process. <laughs> and yeah, and that then you can narrow it down. <laughs> right, and that explains why I'm running out of closet space. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I'm just thinking of like we talked about Paul and what a strong character he was in in putting it kindly as strong. Um, but you've got quite a cast of characters overall. How do you go about writing your characters? And then why did you want to tackle a family with such a tricky dynamic in in the character world? Um, Well, when I first wrote this novel, it was totally different. It was about Natalie, who was married, living in another country, and she gets this package in the mail, and it's drawing her back to the family home. Um, and what it always came back to, and that, that, that outline that didn't really work. So I had rewritten it several times, but what the core stayed the same was always this, this conflict between her and her siblings. So this concept of family and what family means to you, especially as an adult has always fascinated me. I'm an only child. So I think, um, maybe I, I study siblings more. And as I watch my two sons growing up, um, they fight all the time. And sometimes I'm like, oh, are you ever going to be friends? I would just like, they're not, they're not friends at all. They don't support each other at all. It's just always bickering. And I'm like, God, are you going to be 30 and doing this? You know, having wrestling matches and screaming at each other. Are you going to be friends? Are you going to be best men in each other's weddings? Like, I want to know this thing. So I don't know. Um, you know, it's just fascinating to me to see how people choose to be friends with siblings as adults. And um, that's really what I wanted to address. So that was definitely um, something that shaped the ultimate, you know, final version of the story. Um, And then for the side characters, I love writing side characters. I feel like the stakes just aren't as high for them. So there's a little bit more freedom to just be (laughs) Um, really different. (laughs) So I have a lot of fun with side characters. In fact, I have a a writing critique partner who's often told me, stop making them so clownish. (laughs) (laughs) Dial it down on the side characters. You are truly writing like the walk-on character who's going to steal the show. And they're like, hey, maybe, (laughs) maybe, maybe not so (laughs) many good details. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) That's funny you say that because I actually really loved the scenes where Natalie was at girls brunch and some of the things that they were sort of navigating as their group of girls, like going down, um, you know, this road with this friend and the, I loved those little details. So that was a delight to have those moments peppered throughout. Oh, good. I loved writing those ones because again, those friends, um, you know, there wasn't as much at stake for them and they could just be as outrageous as they wanted to be. And maybe that's something that I bring to when I'm writing um, more main characters, I feel, okay, I have, I know there's a job to do. I need them to do certain things and say certain things and move them along in the plot. So there's a little bit more um, of a, of a structure, you know, of a kind of, I don't know, <laughs> keeping them in more of a contained, I guess, process. Uh, but those side characters, they don't have any. They're just out there having a good time. Right. They get to walk in, shake things up, and we can just be like, oh, yeah. you're the fun friend. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Set fire to the place and I'm over here. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have no consequences. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, of course, BLR going on for a little bit now, and you will be hanging out on the discussion board here and there answering questions. And And I want to make sure we leave some room for folks to ask you questions that they're not getting all the answers to here. So <laughs> I wanted to pivot and plug 
your new book that is coming out September of 2023, The Second Chance Hotel. Would you like to give listeners a taste of what they can look forward to? Yes. So that is um, set in another place that I lived, <laughs> Greece. Um, I lived in Greece for a couple of years when I was a kid. And that is really about, um, it's more of a rom-com and it's about two travelers who meet in Greece. They've been backpacking through Europe for a couple months and they meet in Greece. It's their last stop and they get really drunk one night and they get married accidentally and inherit a hotel. And the next morning they're like, um, what do we do with that? All of that. (laughs) So it's a marriage of convenience trope, which I love. And it's also, um, a slow burn romance and also a, um, you know, love letter to Greece <laughs> and also like a, what do you do now? <laughs> Screwed up. What are the consequences? What are you going to do? So you're uh you listed two of my favorite romance tropes. So absolutely. <laughs> yes. Marriage of convenience and slow burn. I 100%. love those too. <laughs> and Greece yeah. that had to be gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> It was really nice. That was in the 80s. So it was different. It's very different from what it is today. We lived in Santorini and um, that's, you know, one of the most popular islands. And it was, it was, it was gorgeous. <laughs> it was incredible. It was very, very, I was very fortunate, fortunate to get to live there. Oh, it sounds dreamy. And so this is what uh, we love to do on the podcast uh, as people that work sort of in the adjacent to publishing industry. We're talking about a very typical family for Big Library Read. We've asked you about your next book that comes out, The Second Chance Hotel. But I always love to ask authors if there's anything that they're working on right now that you can talk about. Um, I can't talk about it just yet, <laughs> but I am <laughs> I am working on an enemies to lovers um book and I'm having so much fun with it. I was just working on the start of it um earlier and just throwing these people at each other. So much fun. <laughs> oh, okay. So now I have even more to look forward to because enemies to lovers is actually my favorite trope. <laughs> Yeah. Oh gosh. You know, there's so many good examples in the genre too, but I, I love it. I, you know, and it never gets old. And I even considered, oh gosh, is this an old one? This is just too tired of a trope, but no, it never is. Just the tension is so good with that trope, I think. And you can build it in so many different ways, but yeah, that tension never gets old. I think it's still the burning favorite in the, in the genre. <laughs> yeah. Now, I wanted to give both Emma and I and the listeners a chance to get to know you a bit more as a person with some nosy questions from a nosy podcaster. What are you reading or listening to right now? Um, Right now, I am reading something that is a little surprising. It's called The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos... Ruiz Zafon, I think. And it's this really lush novel um, set in the 1950s in Barcelona. And it is so cool. And what I love about it is it's essentially about uh, this young man who finds a book by this author who published a bunch of books, but didn't have any success. And somebody is systematically trying to um, get rid of all the books and burn them. So it's kind of a little bit of a mystery. But Um, so a friend of mine told me about this book and I'm like, you know what, that sounds so familiar. And I went and looked on my bookshelf and I had it, but where did this come from? I didn't buy this. I didn't put it here. And I thought, well, maybe I picked it up in a little library, you know, in a little free library in my neighborhood and just came home and stuck it on the shelf, but it's never been read. It's brand new. So I love, (laughs) I love that it kind of fits with the mystery and the plot of this book. So it's really cool. Um, so that's a little bit different, but some of the other books that I've read recently that I absolutely loved was um, La Vie According to Rose by Lauren Parvizi. Oh, this is such a good story about a woman who um, helps everyone else in her life except herself. And she goes to Paris, she takes the dream trip to Paris. And it's just such a good story of grief and new beginnings and Paris. And um, I think I loved it too, because it was part of that whole travel, you know, set in a different uh, country story. So that was lovely. Loving um, One Summer in Savannah by 
Tara Shelton Harris, which is just a gorgeous story that also came out recently in July. And um, it's about forgiveness. It's it's a totally unique twist on what forgiveness means. Love that. Um, and then another one I read recently that I'm really looking forward to everybody reading on July 25th when it publishes is Someone Just Like You by Meredith Shore. And this is super fun. It's a great enemies to lovers story. It, that one really sizzles and it's set in New York City. So it's super fun. As Emma's adding it to her TBR. <laughs> yeah. I saw the eyes go off to the side. I'm like, yeah. she's adding it to the cart. I was. I was adding it on Goodreads to my want to read. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I'll yeah. forget. <laughs> right. Same. Yeah. That list just keeps growing. <laughs> it's never ending. <laughs> never ending. <laughs> no. And a uh, part of which is because of our public libraries. And so that is going to be my next question for you. We, we've talked about it a little bit thus far, but when we mention public libraries, what comes to mind? Do you have a particularly fond memory at the library or again, like your home branch that you always visit? Yeah. Well, right now, uh, you know, I live in the uh, East Bay of the Bay Area. So my public library is the Contra Costa Library, and it's huge. It serves a lot of branches over a bunch of different cities, um, and their collection is really large. And I absolutely love using the Libby app and going in there and saying, oh, what's the Lucky E-Day collection looking like right now? (laughs) And just, you know, like, oh, gosh, should I look this one up and place a hold. Yeah, my hold list is long on that one. And um, sometimes I'm like, oh, I can't wait. And I'll, you know, I'll get the ebook. Uh, but I love using it for ebooks. In fact, I think when that really became, when Libby really became, um, and before Libby uh, Overdrive had the app um, widely used, I was like, this is, this is it. Because I read a lot on my, um, my tablet, mostly for the backlight, because I read late. <laughs> late night in bed and my husband doesn't love the light on. So that's really, um, I love it for that. And I love just uh, obviously storing many more books than my house can hold because I can store them digitally too. (laughs) So um, yeah, it's, it's lovely. And, you know, as my kids grew up, I would, you know, definitely have like, we would have summer library days and we would go to the library and I'd say, just, you know, go ahead and stock up and check out, we would check out just tons of stuff for them and, you know, then go back the following week and return them and get more. So I really wanted them to, to enjoy and have that feeling of magic when you come in there, like you can get as many as you can carry out. That to me is like, like, you know, it's like Christmas every time you go in there. (laughs) Right. There's real magic to that between like all the programs you can do. And the fact that, right. There's no, like, you can only get one thing. It's, it's the, like, there is no cost yeah. here. Get what you would want, what you would like to read over the next week. We'll be back next week. Yes. Oh, I yeah, love that. Absolutely. It is magical. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, I I love this question. Uh, what is your go-to cafe order? <laughs> what what is oh, the go-to drink? What do you have to have, you know, if you're just having a fun day around town or whatever? Um, in a cafe, I can always just go for a latte, but it has to be lightly, you know, lightly sugared. So it's going to have to be a flavor, but not overly sugared, or I will go into (laughs) meltdown, sugar induced meltdown. So just, you know, it has to strike the right balance. So I love a vanilla latte. I I think I have to say, and I'm sorry to say, I really love a pumpkin spice latte in the fall. (laughs) There is no shame in that game (laughs) because I'm also a, sucker for a wintertime peppermint mocha. So I'll also announce the basic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, there's just no, it's, oh gosh, there's just something like, you know, just going there. I know they start earlier and earlier mm. in the year with the pumpkin spice and all the, the fall flavors, but then you're like, oh, fall, which of course is the best season of all. Um, but lately I've been enjoying lavender lattes, which I didn't know were a thing and which sound like they could go either way, but I really like them a lot. <laughs> I love a lavender latte. I also love um, a London fog, which oh, is, yeah. yeah, especially if they yeah, have lavender that. to put into it, then it's, that's how it should be in, in my humblest yeah. of opinions. But I agree. I'm a big tea drinker too. And oh yeah, London fog is great. <laughs> I'm a sucker for Earl Grey. Who doesn't love like those bergamot notes? (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
I'm with you. A lightly sugared latte is kind of the way. Can't be too sweet, but just like a little something. Yeah. Yeah. With a cookie or a croissant also on the side. Oh, see a croissant? I am a croissant girly. We're big advocates (laughs) for croissants here. (laughs) Me too. I have to say, hands down, my favorite thing. (laughs) I love a flaky, buttery pastry. Yep. You're in a good company here. Yeah, solid company. (laughs) You know what the problem with croissants, though, is that you can't really make them yourself. They take like two days to make, and you really ultimately should have a press that rolls out these. Yeah. Fine I'm pieces not, of pastry and yeah. I'm not trying no to laminate that. dough. No, no, thank you. No. <laughs> Do you know, it's so much work. It's really funny. My mom used to make croissants when we were growing up and she would like have the dough rising on cookie sheets. She'd put it in our laundry room, like on the dryer. Oh my gosh. It was like a whole process. And so anytime she was like, I'm making croissants, we would know we would have them with it like two days later. <laughs> Two days later. Yeah. And you have to use special butter, I think too, with like really yeah. high butter fat content. You, yeah. I think you use European butter or even special European butter. Yeah. I like didn't really fully understand the process until I was older. I'm like, okay, mom, she hasn't made them in many years now because I think it's too involved. Yeah. I was going to say, Emma, yeah. can you convince your mom to make croissants? <laughs> I can ask her to make them tell for the her podcast I, show. Tell her I want them. I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we know that you will be online a little bit on biglibraryread.com, looking at the discussion board questions. You will be doing a wonderful library author talk with Contra Costa Library Systems um, in about a week or so. And so outside of those areas, we wanted to make sure our listeners know where they can find you online, where they can interact with you during the program. Yeah, absolutely. And beyond. Yeah, I'm at sierragodfrey.com. And I've got a newsletter that I try to fill with material that supports some of the book stuff. So like I did uh, how I came to live in Greece as a kid and my last newsletter. So kind of interesting stuff. And I had a lot of good comments about that. Like, I didn't know yet. Or, you know, it was so cool to hear the backstory of that. So um, yeah, you can sign up for my newsletter on my site. Um, I probably am on Instagram most of the time these days at Sierra Godfrey. I've just started using threads. So we'll see where that goes. (laughs) We're we're still holding out on that one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Waiting to see what shakes out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I'm on Twitter for for as long as I can be Sierra Mm -hmm. Godfrey also. Well, that's fantastic. I, I always advocate for signing up for an author's newsletter because you're going to just get beautiful things in your inbox. Like <laughs> who doesn't want to hear the story of how you came to live in Greece? Yeah. I'm, you know, and I like to give like little heads up to the newsletter subscribers, like got this coming. It's kind of exciting or recipes. I've got a lot of really good Greek recipes that support uh, the second chance hotel. So those will be in there too. Love it. Well, Sierra, we are out of time together, which I don't know where time goes these days anymore, (laughs) uh, but that means that it was a great talk because I'm so glad that the time flew by while we were together. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us today about both your big library read title. um, uh, Whoa, my brain just stopped there. A very typical family. I started to combine both of them together and your new book coming in September, Second Chance Hotel. So excited to pick up my advanced reader copy of that one. I'll just do a little brag there because I can't wait to read it. (laughs) (laughs) But listeners, remember, Big Library Read is running from July 13th through the 27th. You can pick up and read this title or listen to the audiobook and then participate on Big Library Read dot com and uh you know send additional questions that way sarah anything before we let you go uh, just thank you so much for having me on i'm so so excited for everybody to be able to read this um through big library read yeah and i will add that there is an excerpt of the second chance hotel in at the end of a very typical family for the big library read ebook version Yes, which is so exciting. So if you want a little sneak peek, if you cannot make it into September, because clearly I can't. (laughs) (laughs) Well, listeners, thank you all so much for joining us today. And as always, happy reading. 
Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com, and our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen Podcasts, visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com.